Awesome. Well, uh, welcome, Gators. And uh, I am excited that we have the opportunity today to listen in on a conversation that a lot of our teams are having around issues of racism and social injustice. Uh, mm -hmm. Men's basketball has agreed to programming here and allow us to um, listen while they have a really important conversation. And we'll have a moderated uh, discussion with them. But really, this is a chance for us to hear what they have to say learn from them, um, understand their experiences, what they hope sort of comes out of this current moment and things that we can do to have this um, change all of us. And hopefully that's individually as an organization, as a community, as a country. So I'm excited for the opportunity to hear what they have to say. And with that, I'll turn it over to Denver to get our conversation started. Thanks, Linda. And thanks to uh, our men's basketball team, all, all these guys for being here for today for this discussion. Thanks to those of you who are uh, listening in here with us, both live and those who are uh, gonna be listening uh, after the fact. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. Um, I guess just to get us started, uh, as you all have watched the, uh, you know, and some of you have participated in some demonstrations over the last couple of weeks following um, the killing of George Floyd, uh, What's been on your hearts and your minds these last few weeks? Scotty, would you start us off with some thoughts? Um, I mean, for me personally, I look at it from two different perspectives. Um, the first perspective as an African-American, and obviously the second being an African-American athlete. Um, from the African-American standpoint, I can say that clearly people are tired and fed up of um, the hate crimes, uh, the lack of police accountability, um, and we're tired of the institutional racism that has towered over people of color since the 1860s, you know? So um, people are fed up and that the result that we're seeing today is, you know, it's not new, it's just broadcasted more. Um, and from the athletic standpoint, um, I think I speak for all athletes when I think we all have to understand that we have a moral obligation to use our voice and our platform for not only like the enrichment of equality for future generations, but to be able to provide a voice to those people who feel silenced. You know, that, that's at least how I view this, the, uh, the situation. Uh, Denver, Denver, can I say something? Yeah, go about, ahead. About that, the follow up with what Scotty said, but the, the thing about this one and this situation is, I don't, I think it's different because of what we have going on with COVID. You know, I think this one hits harder. And I think, I think it, it's caught everybody's attention because you think about, you know, that, that Scotty said it's been going on for a long time, but why has this, why has these situations more recently um, caught more people's attention? But I think it's just because everybody has to slow down and listen right now because you can't go about your normal life. So, um, you know, it's tragic what happened, but I think, due to COVID, it's caught more people's attention. Scotty, can you say a little more about, you talked about institutional racism for, maybe for some people who are less familiar with that term. Can you say a little more about what you mean by that? Uh, yes, for sure. Um, institutional racism, basically it's, started from it's it, it's in it's societal based it's in our schools it's in our um incarceration rates um it's in college sports um it's in sports in general um it's in housing um and it's 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 like a it's like a cycle that people like kind of fail to realize um just to give a small example um you know i grew up in the projects of new york right so people around me they only know that lifestyle of uh, of violence and how to really make it out. And say someone, say my, my neighbor went to jail, right? And he's incarcerated for however long, um, and he's supposed to be being rehabilitated, you know, to where he's supposed to be learning how to live a better life. He's supposed to get out of jail and be able to be free in a sense. But you, you take someone out of incarceration, put them back into the environment where they were before when they were committing these crimes, and they have no right to vote. Uh, the likelihood of them getting a job because a, a felon is on their name is not gonna happen. 
Uh, they can't get schooling because where is that funding coming from? It's not like this government's paying for it. It's not like the state's paying for it. It's not like they have the ability to obtain that money in order to put themselves in a better position to go to school. And they fall right back into the cycle of being a criminal or labeled a criminal once again. So if that, I mean, the mass incarceration is just one of the few many examples of um, institutional racism. And we could, I can talk about the school system and how, um, uh, this is this is also a part of the microaggression, but say how we talk about um, American history, quote unquote, right? Uh, people don't talk about how American history and what we're taught in schools is basically they're saying this is white history because you try to label black history to a month, right? And then you, you talk about the same people constantly. I remember when I was in second grade, you know, I, I always hold, heard the story of, you know, Malcolm X and I always heard the story of Rosa Parks and, and Martin Luther King and all these other people, but I never learned about, you know, the Black Wall Street and how white, white mobs entered Oklahoma and Tulsa and basically destroyed, killing over 400 black people and leaving them homeless. You know, you don't learn about that in the school system. And that's a part of them trying to trick you and negate you to think a certain way simply because that's what they want you to think. Thanks, Scotty. Appreciate you on that a little bit more. Um, these topics, racism, social injustice, um, police brutality, these are some uh, tough topics to tackle, but obviously given the current events, it's kind of being thrust to the front of people's minds right now. Um, for, for people who are maybe paying attention to these sort of things, um, you know, for the first time or haven't given them much consideration in the past, what are some of the things that you hope people take away from this moment? Um. I mean, to start, if, if you are someone who is just now deciding to pay attention to the social injustice, uh, the racism, the police brutality, um, in a sense, you have to understand that you're a part of the problem. You know, all these topics are deeply rooted and have been going on for the longest time. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the first riot that really stuck out was in the red summer of uh, 1919, you know, and people really don't talk about that when uh, Black Panthers, you know, were marching. and um, in 1919, that's right after the World War I. So there were, you had people, you had African Americans in our front line who were putting their lives in line for a country that didn't even accept them yet. So you have these people being, you know, and when you're in the front line, when you basically picture in movies, right, you have the, um, the, who we're going to war with, you, and you have us. So they would put all the black people in front and they would be the first targets to go you know what I mean? Um, there's recently a movie called the, um, the Five Bloods that tell that story of that. Um, it's, it's a really good movie. Everyone should pretty much watch it to learn some knowledge about that. But people did that. And while they're putting their lives on the line for a country that they're trying to be accepted by, back home, there's still so much racism, so many hate crimes, and they're not even being considered equal. You know what I mean? And, and, and around that time, we were still considered three-fifths of a human. And to this day, in a sense, we are still viewed as that. So if you don't you know, allow yourself to be educated on a culture that isn't yours. And if you're not willing to accept people that don't look like you and understand their culture and their background and the things they've gone through, um, you know, unconsciously, you're a part of the problem. So like I said, if you're just now trying to get involved and, and you're just now deciding to pay attention to things that have been happening for years upon years, you, you're a part of the problem. So... Yeah. Hey, Denver, I'd like to interject. Sure. Um, you know, I, I like to talk about just build a little bit on what Scotty said and also Coach Nichols earlier. Um, you know, obviously the country's in, in, in a situation where everybody um, is tuned in to, you know, the local news, national news, whoever it may be. And I take this as an opportunity for individuals, as Scotty just said, to educate themselves, to get a better understanding, to understand um, the black culture and other cultures. It's not just the black culture, it's all cultures. Um, you know, obviously you have the opportunity to understand, educate yourself. And I believe, you know, it's, it's not necessarily your duty, but you have the opportunity um, to use your platforms. You know, I was listening to Jeff Goodman, um, his podcast today, uh, number 138, he just talked about the lack of diversity for head coaches in the basketball profession. And you know, you know you, you're able to be enlightened and understand, you, 
the difference in the obstacles that African Americans had to go through in order to move up the coaching ladder. And so after, upon listening to his podcast, I shot him a text message and I basically just said to him, you know, thank you for using your platform. Um, you know, not being scared, not um, being afraid to go against the grain. And so, you know, he shot me back a, a quick text and he said, you know, whatever I can do, I love to use my platform in, in, in order to help you all uh, move up the coaching ladder. And so, like I said, I just think it's an unbelievable opportunity, especially this time to educate yourself, as Scotty mentioned, um, as Coach Nichols said, and, and just know, you know, do do what you can in order to educate yourself um, so that going forward you, you'll be able to be um, a helper within the situation. So, Denver, can I say something too? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I like what Coach um, Nice and Scotty just said about like educating yourself. Because um, I realized when I was studying um, African American history in high school, it was kind of erased, kind of forgotten, and it was kind of like pushed to the side a little bit. And you have to understand that most of the people who don't really understand what's going on, it's not because they're saying screw black people in their history, it's just that they might be a little bit ashamed of what their ancestors did. So I feel like educating yourself will make you really come to the reality if you did do that, because we still live in the reality like years later, you know what I'm saying? So that's really the missed divide. People try to ignore it and be like, oh, nah, but you really have to like confront that reality that, yes, you know, that happened in the past and it's still going on today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Osa. Anything else for anybody on that question before we move ahead? So let's let's take a little bit of a step back from the current events and just talk a little bit about um, some personal experiences. Um, so I'm curious, how old were you guys when you first became aware um, that you'd be treated differently in this country because of the color of your skin, because you're black? And how did it affect you both at that age uh, as well as now? And Noah, would you start us off on that one? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Um, well, I'm... Like my middle school, well, my elementary and middle school, I went to a public school, which was like predominantly black. And, um, you know, once I got to high school, I went to a, a private school, which was predominantly white. So I would say probably when I was around, like, probably like my freshman year, once I got to a to the private school. And um, I mean, I was pretty much like the only black person in my, in several of my classes. And um, I mean, it was just just certain experiences that I had where, I mean, like my freshman year, I mean, I, it would be times when, you know, the teacher would say something that I didn't understand and I would like ask questions and like her response to me, like the only black person in the class would be like completely different than, you know, a white person asking that question. And I mean, it, I didn't really think much of it in the beginning, but I mean, once it just continuously happened and, you know, I didn't fully get the responses that I want. I really wasn't learning, you know, at the rate that I wanted to. And that's when I got to, you know, I talked to my parents about it. And they ended up sending an email to to my school. And um, after that, I mean, stuff started to change. And then that's when I realized that, you know, it was, it was you know, a little bit of, you know, I guess like racism in that. I mean, it, it was it was definitely hard for me to you know really take that in and understand that you know being being black going to a you know predominantly white school. I mean, it's going to be situations like that even if you don't really think that it is. So, I mean, that's pretty that's that's one of the experiences that I had, and um, there's been a few other ones. You know, just little ones that you know could be considered racist that I didn't really taken at the moment now thinking back at it but um that's pretty much one of the biggest ones that I you know once I really started to realize that it was racism mm -hmm. thanks Noah. Anthony you want to chime in there yeah um when I was 12 years old um probably my first experience I was walking back home uh, from the courts with one of my friends um and the cop stops us at night and um, he's like, what are you guys doing? And I was like, you know, uh, officer, we just um, coming from the courts. We're just trying to get back home, walk back home. And he asked for my name. And I was like, Anthony. And he asked for my last name. And I said, Daruji. And he's like, oh, you probably got some weed on you, don't you? Probably selling weed. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't do that. 
we're just trying to go back home. And he was like, uh, all right. Um, he was like, you need a ride? And I was like, no, because I was, I was afraid that he was going to just take me, probably take me to a precinct or something and question me. And um, so from that day on, I was like, wow, like the way I'm perceived in society is, is different. And I got to be aware of that. You know what I mean? That's something I'm still aware of to this day. Like when you're growing up, they tell you, don't judge a book by its cover. But it's crazy because that's like, that's, that's what it seems like all we do in this society. And, um, you know, I'm aware that, you know, I'm a tall black male, you know, tattoos, dreadlocks, whatever that might be. So, I mean, I'm definitely aware of how people perceive me. And that's just the sad reality. But I have to, like, navigate throughout society, you know. Hey, can I interject? And since you're on that subject, can you uh... – can you elaborate a little bit on, on your experience here? I want to say it was in the past month where you were out for a job. You care to talk about that? Yeah. So I don't want people to feel like guilty uh, for me, but um, I was jogging because I was just trying to get some, uh, just trying to stay in shape, get some work in. And um, I was jogging and uh, passing through a neighborhood. Um, I would say like a white neighborhood. Um, and I was running behind uh, a couple and I had said like, excuse me. Um, and I, I didn't want to sound like too loud. And uh, they turned around and like frightened. Like I was about to like try to like kill them or something. And then like, I was just like, why, why do they have that fear? It's like, sometimes I feel like I have to like pretty much assert, assert my humanity to people because they might like, you know, just make assumptions just based on how like I look and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, I definitely experienced it a lot, a lot of microaggression, you know, I'm sure uh, we all um, experience and surface through throughout, uh, throughout our lives. But um, I mean, we keep pushing forward. Thanks, Anthony. Just kind of, Piggybacks off that question, um, you know, there was a, a TikTok video recently that kind of went viral um, of a young man named Cameron Welch. For those of you who may not have seen it, if you just Google Cameron Welch um, video, you'll be able to find it. But he listed about a minute straight of unwritten rules that his mom had asked him to follow um, as he was growing up. Uh, what are some unwritten rules that, 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 that you have to follow uh, in your life, like you said, Anthony, just to, to, to navigate um, through your daily life. Scott, do you want to start us there? Uh, I mean, there weren't, like, I never had a sit down conversation with my mother or with my grandmother about, you know, these unwritten rules, um, simply because of the things that, like, are inherited, you know, like, Growing up as a as a black person, especially a black male in America, there's certain like like Anthony said, you have to maneuver and navigate a certain way. You know, when you ha when you are around certain people, you have to talk a certain way, you have to present yourself a certain way, and people because people just make assumptions. You know, and you know, for us, I mean, some of the things that I think I, I knew growing up without even having to be told was being before the streetlights came on. You know, don't play with anything that could even remotely resemble a gun. Um, my mother got mad at me one time for, you know, making the gun shape with my hands. You know, people, kids do this on a daily basis, but that's something I wasn't allowed to do, you know, and, and I understood why. You know, it was never a conversation that needed to be had or there was never rules that needed to be set. There was just certain, I guess, <laughs> like African-American protocols that, you know, we all know of and we all have to follow because of where we are, how we grew up and what we, you know, assume is going to happen if we don't follow those guidelines. Did anybody else have something on that one? Coach Pink? Yeah, mute medium. Okay, here we go. 
a athletic athletically I, I know a lot of these guys probably have dealt with it but me growing up as a young athlete uh playing peewee football it was always the black quarterback stereotype that you that you couldn't do it uh the white guys were better at it and i just know growing up eventually getting into high school i made the jump to become a black quarterback and be really good at it but just growing up and not having the opportunity in peewee football or seventh and eighth grade football and in the ninth grade as well it was it was one of those you know moments that you'll think about here for really the rest of your life Denver, um, I'd like to carry on from where Coach Pinky just left off. Um, two rules I like to talk about. Um, one, I think it's one of the most obvious rules. You know, growing up, um, I had a unique situation being raised by a school teacher and also a police officer. And so um, very different dynamic in my household, two individuals who served in the line of service. But, um, you know, my mother would always preach to myself and my sister and my other siblings growing up. Um, that we just had to be uh, twice as better as everyone else. And, you know, the older we got uh, within the household, we were always, you know, your, your brain starts to develop and you're often asking questions, say, Mom, why do you always say these statements to us? And she would say, you know, you have to be twice as good as your white counterpart in order just to have an opportunity. And so when that sinks in, you know, you question yourself at such a young age and you ask yourself, but then at the same time, that drives you to be the best version of yourself uh, on a daily basis. And then um, the the other unspoken rule that a lot of people um, talk about is just, you know, especially growing up in the South, one of the main things that African-American women try to say um, to their sons is, look, don't, don't date um, a, a white woman. And so I remember uh, my opportunity going up and having the opportunity to go to Kent State University in Ohio. And I remember being around some of my friends and some of my teammates and I was terrified and it's crazy. It was like, hey, you know, this individual here, she likes you, um, do you have any interest? And I would say, hey man, I'm terrified of her. And he said, why are you terrified? I say, you know, that's the unwritten rule where you can't talk to someone of, of a different color, especially, you know, a white woman. And so, um, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, um, I had the opportunity to meet my best friend in life, Leticia Mincy, and a lot of you know her. Um, you know, she's fairly light-skinned, and sometimes she can be confused for being white. And so just having the opportunity to kind of navigate life and may have missed that opportunity, just listen to those unwritten rules, you know, rules can always change. And a lot of those rules um, change based on your life experiences. And so um, just continue to educate yourself, as I spoke on before. I think that's a huge opportunity for everyone to continue to learn, change the rules, and also learn about those rules at the same time. Yeah, Denver, can I add here, because um, I have a 20-year-old son that, that goes to UF now, and um, you know, we were having a casual conversation the other day, and one of the things that really struck me is I have these same conversations with him, right? Um, if you are encountered by the police, you know, cooperate, be submissive, you know, this whole thing. So he's telling me about a time not too long ago, he, his license, uh, his registration was expired. So he got pulled over by a police car. And uh, in the time that the officer came over to his window to talk to him, two other police cars pulled up. So you have three cars for one 20 year old kid with an expired registration. And that alone um, was striking to me, but even more so that it was so normal to him, he didn't even mention it. He brought it up in casual conversation the other day, uh, but when it happened, he didn't come home and tell me I had three cars surrounding my car because I had uh, an expired registration. And it becomes, you know, ingrained in his experience that that's a normal day. He didn't even think anything of it. Um, quite frankly, broke my heart. Um, I would like to add on to that too, because that happened to me when I was at um, my last school too. Um, I got pulled over for a signal light. But when I got pulled over, he um, he told me to step out the car because he tried to pull me over under a bridge. And like the things that be going on nowadays, you know, I wasn't very comfortable, you know, pulling under a dark bridge. So I pulled in where it was a bunch of houses and a bunch of lights. And once 
I stopped. He got on a loudspeaker and told me to step out the car and walk back to his car. And once I walked back there, he automatically put me in handcuffs. He didn't ask, um, he didn't ask like none of my, like my license, my registration, he automatically put me in handcuffs. And I was in the back of his police car for about 30 minutes before he came back. And I had like two of my teammates in the car with me. So he came back and um, he said, um, did, uh, did I smell that in my car? I said, smell what? And he said, um, it smells like marijuana in your car. And so next thing I know, um, five more police cars put up behind him. And they didn't even ask like to search my car or anything. They pulled my two teammates out of my car and they, um, they searched my car for, you know, drugs or anything like that. And they didn't find anything and they put all my, like, everybody in handcuffs and all of that. So after they got done, they trashed like my whole car, all of that. And they let my teammates go, but they kept me in the back of the car for like at least 30 more minutes. And then after all of that happened, he, he got out the car. He let me out and said, okay, you can go now. We just gonna give you a ticket for uh, uh, not turning on your signal light. So it was kind of, you know, kind of like a scary like moment for me, you know what I'm saying? But it like was kind of usual because you know, other things that was happening nowadays, but kind of frightening. Thanks for sharing that, Tyree. So that that is obviously, you know, goes beyond microaggressions. Um, but some of the things that we've heard do a little bit like Anthony, the the reaction of the couple when they just saw you, you know, can, can you guys give us some examples maybe of of these microaggressions that um, can really accumulate uh, and have an effect uh, on you guys that, that people may or may not even realize they're doing it. Maybe, um, you know, it may be conscious, but it may not. Um, can you give us some examples of some of those types of things that, that, that you deal with, Scotty? Um, I think one of the most common microaggressions that I personally heard, and I think probably all of my teammates have heard, is you know, people are shocked and surprised if we open our mouths and we tend to be well spoken. You know, I, I went, I went to, I went to Randy School where, like Noah, I was predominantly white. You know, and I moved around my entire life, so I, I kind of never developed an accent or you know a, a way of talking at all. So I just, I kind of just speak. You know, and I, I've always been someone who's been intrigued by words, so I, you know, I, I choose to talk a certain way. And the fact that when I talk, you know, people are surprised by the fact that we have the ability to articulate and we have their ability to, you know, not talk with a certain slang, you know, like they expect us to talk with, you know, and, 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 that, and that within itself, when they're surprised, they think they're giving a compliment to us when, you know, like you said, unconsciously, they, they could be giving um, a microaggression. And the, the, the thing with micro microaggressions are like, it's, I think we all have to understand, like it's hard and confusing to, it's, it's a hard and confusing task to get white people to realize when they are the sender of a microaggression, you know? And, 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 and it's hard for them to realize that because it's sometimes scared, them. it scares them. You know, people want to be viewed as morally good and they want to be viewed as decent and they wouldn't want to do anything unconsciously or consciously that could view them as a bad person. But they do this thing, they do this all the time. They do it in music, when they're rapping our songs. Um, they do it when we open our mouths and we're surprisingly educated and we're surprisingly able to articulate and we're using words that they think that, you know, we shouldn't know. One thing that I heard in school all the time is like, Scotty, you're not really black, you sound white. And the way that I view that is like, so you're telling me that white is educated and black is not. You know, I, I, I was never taught that. So I never got that. And people don't understand those. People don't even really know what racial micro, microaggressions are because they, you know, because they, you know, they refuse to educate themselves in these things, but they say it and do it every single day. Hey, Scotty. Anthony, did you have something there? 
Yeah. Um, like, I think a lot of us uh, experience this as well. Like, if you're walking down the street and, like, people just completely cross the street um, because they see you approaching, um, that happens, like, a lot. You know, uh, it's been happening since, like, I was a kid. Um, or you could walk past somebody's car and they might, you know, uh, quickly, like, lock the door or a, a woman clutches her purse when you, you walk in the train. Um, so, like, you see it a lot. You see it a lot. Um, but like I said, like, I think they, a lot of people do it, like, not even knowing. And because it's not, like, so, like, out there, it's kind of, like, it's very, it's very, like, hurtful. Mm -hmm. uh, Coach Nichols, did you have anything on this topic here, microaggressions? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, you know, obviously, I think this is 10th year coaching. Um, I mean, we even see it in the coaching business, I, in the profession. You know, I know these guys as players. I know they deal with it. Um, and we deal with it as coaches. I always remember, and, you know, Jack May, you know, he's on the call. He's he's going to be a, a professional for us this year. But, you know, when his dad left to take the Florida Atlantic job, you know, Coach White was like, I need another assistant. I need another assistant. And we, we say, Coach, okay, you know, you, you probably – you need a white guy, right? And he said, no, I want the best guy. And I said, okay. I said, well, I mean, if if you hire – you know, if you hire a black guy, they're going to – you know, the – the narrative is going to be, okay, there's no X and O's guy on the staff. Where's your X and O's guy? So now, now what it's come down to are in, in the coaching profession, there are code words. There are code words to hiring different coaches. And, and you can see right through the code words. Like for me, for example, they'll say, um, we need a guy that can relate. Or we need a guy that can recruit. So then, you know, you know they're talking about African-Americans. But why, why is it that? you know, the white guys can't relate or, or whatever. You know, why, why is it like that? Or, you know, we need an analytical guy. We need an X and O's guy. And then in the culture profession, they're not talking about African-Americans. So I think now in, in the profession and in society, there, there are code words to, to hide behind those stereotypes. And, um, you know, you, you can kind of see right through that. And, and, and I think that's something that we deal with at this, at this level, even being, you know, assistant coaches. I like to confirm that 1,000%, you know, with our staff. Uh, I work with three black assistants, a black operations director. We're as diverse as anyone in the country. And we are labeled as a really good recruiting staff. Um, but where's your X and O's guy? It doesn't make any sense. We've got great X and O's guys. Are you kidding me? Uh, why, why are we labeled that way? Uh, Good stuff by Coach Nice. I agree a thousand percent. Thanks, Coach. Anybody else have any thoughts here before we move on? Uh, I wanted to share um, my own experience. I mean, um, I was, I mean, it probably goes beyond, um, like you said, microaggressions, but I was actually flying out of Gainesville after my visit. And um, both me and my dad were at the airport going through security. And, and so when I laid out like mine and my dad's passports, um, obviously it said like Russian Federation, right? And this security guard, uh, immediately he pulled me, both, like, both me and my dad to the side. And he said, you got to go through uh, all our bags and search all my clothes that I was wearing and you know it just just because he saw that I'm from Russia you know and obviously I don't go around and show everyone that oh yeah look I'm from Russian Federation so people don't know that um, I'm from there and it's just so I don't feel that way every single day by black people in this country do and it's just you know it just feels hurtful and sad and I just feel like it needs to change 
Thanks, Sam. Yeah, and I think mean, what, what Coach Nichols was touching on too in terms of the, the code words, I mean, that's something to, um, you know, that, that anybody who watches games on TV, and I'm not trying to call any uh, particular announcers or anything out, but, but, but you will hear it, you know, it's the, the, the white guy is the gritty guy, he's the gym rat, and, and the black guy is the athletic guy, and, you know, he just has a lot of natural talent. So look for that um, in, uh, you know, as you consume sports, um, you know, the, those code words are, are, are everywhere. Um, Denver, I, when I played, I, I was the heady point guard. You know, how often do you see that? Yep. And it would, it would kind of make you feel sick to your stomach when you hear on TV, you know, on a replay. Uh, it's not right. Yep. Uh, what does the phrase Black Lives Matter mean to you guys? Scotty? Or Ant, when do you guys want to start? Um, that's definitely a loaded question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess to kind of sum it up, um, when I hear the term, you know, it, it gives me hope for a lot of things, but it, at the same time, it stirs up like so much anger, you know, um, I think there's hope because of what the Black Lives Matter movement has done for Black communities, for Black businesses, and for like the rising generation of people, like regardless of race, you know, I, I've ran two protests now and, um, partnered with Black Lives Matter movement and, um, when you look out into the crowd and you're giving these speeches, you see more white people in these crowds than I think have ever been before. Um, you know, and especially young white kids, you know, holding up Black Lives Matter signs, things like that. You know, it, it, it's definitely hopeful, but at the same time, there's anger because the fact that we have to say our lives matter at all is, is, is a problem, you know? And it, it, it's in the fact of how much, how much heat the Black Lives Matter movement has stirred up. You know, you have anti groups who, who say like all lives matter, you know, or, or blue lives matter. And they fail to realize that one, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. You know, we're, 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 we're saying the same thing. You know what I mean? And they're not realizing that. And then you have people that say blue lives matter. And from my perspective, blue lives don't even exist. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can take off your blue uniform, but I can't take off my black skin. You feel me? So it, it's very, it, it's, it's crazy how much of a good thing, how much of the narrative can be changed by other people and try to make it seem like it's such a bad thing. Thanks, Scotty. Anthony, do you have something there? Yeah, like, I like what Scotty said, like, people might miss the understand um, like Black Lives Matter. It's not saying that um, only Black Lives Matter. Like obviously, all lives matter because we're all we're all human, you know. So it's just, I feel like Black Lives Matter is just like a cry. It's a cry out, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like look at what like Black people have been oppressed for hundreds and hundreds of years, and nothing seems like it's ever changing. It only seems like things are just transforming in different ways. So I look at Black Lives Matter, it's like, you know, like, there is a problem here. There's an issue, you know what I mean? So just trying to bring that attention. Thanks, Anthony. Anybody else have anything on that topic? I think, just to come back in, I think a way for people, like, I've seen this before, and I never really thought about explaining it this way, but there is this, um, there's actually this TikTok where they're showing, they're showing someone going to help a burning house, right? And But then there's someone who owns a home that's not burning. And the person who's going to help the burning house is like, come on guys, like, like let's, go help the, let's go help the burning house. And then the rebuttal to that, the person says, you know, what about my house? Like my house matters too. And, and, and the guy's like, well, is your house burning? You know, and, and the guy's like, no, but you know, my house matters too. And he's like, but is it burning? You know what I mean? And it's just this dialogue that's very back and forth. And the person is so like strong headed and, you know, you know, left minded in a sense that they're not realizing that like the person who's going to the burning house understands that like all homes matter 
and you know, to use that for reference, but this house right now is burning down to ashes. So we all have to come together and help rebuild this house and put the fire out. I thought that was a, a great analogy of the, um, of the situation. So I thought I'd share that. Awesome, thanks, Scotty. So, you know, you guys obviously have some visibility and a platform here um, as basketball players at the University of Florida. People may look at you guys and think like, hey, you know, these guys have made it. They don't have to worry about these. They play basketball for the Florida Gators. They're on TV all the time. Has that been your experience or, or, or not? Uh, Coach Mincy, do you want to actually chime in here for, for us? We'll do. Um, I would just talk about as far as um, small example. You know, a lot of times, you know, Scotty just talked about as far as putting on, um, as a police officer, you have the opportunity to take off a uniform. And so, you know, as athletes, as coaches, you know, oftentimes, you know, I had this polo on and I'm walking in the community people are going to perceive me entirely different. They're going to act a different way because I had this logo across my chest and they say, Oh, look, you know, that's, um, he must, he must be with the Florida Gators. He must, you know, coach football, basketball, one of those sports. And so it gives you an opportunity, it gives you um, the chance to, as people like say, to get to the door, to have opportunity to be invited in into the, someone's home. But, um, let me take off this shirt. Let me put on a white t-shirt. Let me put on uh, just some black, you know, shorts and, and my running shoes. And, and Coach Nichols and I talk about this all the time, especially the day after, you know, the, the Floyd situation occurred. And, you know, the, the dynamic changes, whether you're walking in your neighborhood, whether you're running around, um, trying to get some exercise, um, you know, the dynamic changes. And so a lot of times, you know, Coach Nichols and I talked about, you, you a lot of times you want to run around with your Florida gear on just to have some 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 level of safety and to maybe suppress others' feelings when you're running by them, um, as Anthony talked about earlier. And so you have the opportunity, um, obviously with this shirt, um, the platform we have here to continue to educate and you know be uh, somebody that people can look at and uh, have the opportunity to uh, reach out to. But at the same time, like I said. Once we take this, you know, this blue polo off or we take those jerseys off, um, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, don't see us for who we truly are. And so um, definitely blessed to have the platform, this opportunity to be a coach, uh, definitely can reach out and help others uh, within the community, especially. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Coach. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of times, like, for me, I don't, I don't really like to tell people what I do for a living because I don't want them to treat me any differently. Um, you know, for example, you're walking around and you got, like Coach Minty said, you got a Florida polo on, you're going to run into an old man who's got a five-year-old grandson who he thinks is going to be the next up and coming star. You don't, you don't, you know, you don't have time for all that. So, um, you know, quick story, when I was up there in New Jersey, um, you know, I was recruiting Scotty, I went up to see uh, Scotty and Alex, you know, in New Jersey, you, you can't make the uh, U-turns. So I forgot about the U-turn. So, you know, I pulled a U-turn trying to get to my hotel. And then cop pulled me over, you know, he came out aggressive, um, you know, asking me why, you know, why made the U-turn. And, you know, that's one incident where I'm, I'm really quick to tell people what, what I do, because I knew if he knew that I was of some kind of importance due to what I did, not who I, who I am, he would have reacted a different way. And, you know, that goes along the lines of what, what Coach Mitzi's saying, but you know, a lot of times we, we, we throw on Florida Gator stuff just so if we do get pulled over, if somebody questions us, okay, we look like we do what we said we do. And, you know, that's something that a lot of people don't really understand. Like, you know, even as African-Americans, when you feel like you've made it or whatever, I mean, you know, the one lady's telling LeBron to shut up and dribble. So it's like, um, you know, it's still, it's still even though what you do um, is important, of, of importance is still at the same time like you, you have to make sure you uh you protect yourself and and you know that's as crazy as, as it sounds that's one way we protect ourselves because we have those thoughts when we run around the community when we exercise yeah and like a, a similar situation happened to me too um like it's around the time when i first got my car and i ended up getting pulled over and you know the cop came up to me and I actually used that 
I mean, saying that like I was on the floor. And I was back home. I was back home in Baltimore. And I said that I was on the Florida basketball team. And she ended up going back and, uh, you know, going back to her car and then coming back and said like, uh, yeah, good, have a good season. Didn't even give me anything, like no like ticket or anything. Just like, yeah, just have a great season. And, um, you know, everything's okay. And I was just like, okay. And I just, I just left right after that. But like, you know, using that, I mean, just like Coach Nichols said, like sometimes, I mean, being an athlete like this, I mean, that's just something that you would have to use to like even protect yourself. So, um, I mean, I was just going off of, you know, just a similar situation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Noah. Yeah, I mean, I could chime in on that too as well. Yeah. Uh, I say when Tyree, I, had, I think I was on um, Tyree host in the summer. And like the the police have pulled us over. This I probably say like eight or nine, but the police have pulled us over and trying to say like I didn't have my seatbelt on. But like when I have my seatbelt, I have my arm over the seatbelt. All like that's how I ride. I don't know. I just don't like it. Like so, that's on the police. But he seen it at the last minute. Then he like asked us. Like he asked me. He just asked for my license. And then he asked to do playing sports and I like basketball. So then he went back to his car for like ten minutes. And then he just gave us like my license back. And it's like, just tell us, all right, I'm just going to give you a warning this time. But, like, it was, like, no point for him, like, to pull us over. Like, everybody in the car had their seatbelt on. But it was just, I don't know, it was just, like, the fact that I said I would play for the battle team that he didn't, then he gave me a, a, a ticket. But if I didn't say that, I probably, I, I feel like he would have given me one. So, in, in some ways, it's almost like you're, you're uh, if I'm understanding this right, like, your, your status has to almost stand in for your humanity, is that is that right? Like the like, yeah. Empathy there if you're a, a basketball player, but not just as a as a human, right? It, it, am I am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I look. I mean, I feel like all athletes have to kind of like 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 I said before, have to present themselves a certain way. So, like to kind of go back to the question, like you said, like people saying that we've made it or we don't have to worry about stuff like this. I think we have to, I think it's not that we don't want to, it's the fact that people fail to realize when we do worry about things like this, unless you have a status, a status of like LeBron James or Michael Jordan, or, you know, your, your, your top of what, you know, your sport is one, people really don't care about your opinion to, to, to begin with because you're viewed as just an athlete. And <clears throat> secondly, people don't know that when you speak about things that could potentially rile fans up and go against your word, you lose money, you lose endorsements, you lose this, you lose that, you lose fans because they like your franchise, you know, Colin Kaepernick is a great example, obviously, you know, he spoke out about what he believed in and his franchise and, you know, the, the word of basketball football thought that he shouldn't have been talking the way he was talking um, talking about the things he was talking about and using his platform the way that he did. So he lost money. Um, he lost his job and he lost fans because they didn't have the same political or societal views as someone that they, you know, could have looked up to. So in a sense, we have to like either close our mouths or, you know, have a huge following in order for people to actually listen to what we're saying as athletes. Yeah, that's a good point because um, speaking about Colin Kaepernick, I think uh, he quoted one time, he said, like, it's tragic that, um, um, like, a lot of athletes, they're feeling and thinking the same things, but they feel, they fear that if they speak out, um, it's going to jeopardize, you know, uh, their careers and they have people to feed and, you know, people to look after for. So it's like, that's kind of a struggle too, you know, being a, a athlete, a black athlete at that, um, feeling like you have to compromise or not show up as your whole self in the spaces that you're in. Um, you know, so that's a constant battle. Um, but yeah, that's a good point that uh, Scotty uh, touched on. Thanks, Anthony, that's really powerful. Thank you guys. Um, this is our, our last question here. Um, and 
try to end on a, a little bit of a hopeful note. So what, if anything, <clears throat> excuse me, gives you guys hope in this moment that a better future is ahead? Anthony, you want to start us off? I mean, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. So that's my hope. Um, I have a hope that God can change the hearts of people um, because he's changed mine. And, um, you know, as a black man, I'm going to seek and fight for justice. And I'm always going to try to be the best person on loving and forgiving to others, no matter if you're black, white, Mexican, Asian, no matter what. Um, but I hope for things that are unseen. And I know that there's going to be justice in heaven in uh, the age to come. So um, really, Romans 12, 12 says that, um, says rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. So my hope is just that, you know, people's minds, people's hearts can change, you know, and we might truly see, you know, better tomorrow. Thanks, Anthony. Anybody else want to chime in there? Um, I mean, and also, just like what Scotty was saying when he said he, uh, you know, had a lot of different protests. I mean, well, was in, a, you know, led two different protests and um, just looked in the crowd and see, like the amount of white people that were there. And, um, you know, just like I said, I went to a, a private school where it was predominantly white. And um, other than those like little situations that I had, I mean, I mean, I was, I was really close with, I have a lot of like white friends that I'm like, I mean, I still talk to today. And even people that I met at Florida. So it was like, I mean, it's not everyone. And I mean, I can see, you know, some change and, some things that, you know, are eventually, you know, going go the way that we want it to. But I mean, it's just, it's just that, you know, it's a lot of people that don't really believe in all of this right now. And is 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 you can, we can have is, you know, all those people that were at the protests and all that, it's still like millions of other people that are still like not in the, in the right space. So, I mean, hopefully stuff gets in, going in the right direction. And I mean, there's, it is some steps forward that we have been taking, but I mean, I think I think that it is eventually gonna, you know, end up getting getting some justice. Thanks, Noah. I, I think to 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 add on to what Noah said, I think I'm definitely hopeful for time, because uh, I think over time so many things have changed for not only like the black community, but for like LGBTQ and for Latinos and, you know, other, you know, oppressed uh, communities. Um, but it, when I first, you know, thought about this question, it was hard for me to like find things that kind of made me hopeful because of the simple fact that history always repeats itself. You know what I mean? And, and, and in a sense, that's scary because, you know, George Floyd and people, you know, could go back to the first question of how, you know, it, it's, people are finally starting to pay attention and there's been this crazy uproar and, you know, people have the ability to listen in and lock in, you know, this is, the, this is the same intention that, you know, Emmett Till got after his situation. You know what I mean? So it's, it's just, a, it's just another one, then another one and another one. And there's a list of names that just are added to the list every single minute, every single day, every single year, you know? So it's, it's a question of, you know, not rewriting history, but, you know, creating new history. So, the, you know, the question is, can we do that? Like, are we going to allow ourselves to, you know, unify and allow history to, like, not be rewritten? Because I don't want to say that, but, like, to start fresh in a sense. You know, because history repeats itself. And that's the thing I'm scared of the most. And that's why sometimes I'm extremely hopeful and other times I'm just hopeless. Denver, Denver, I'm hopeful that the conversations continue because I think um, a lot of people on this call and on this panel, you know, I, I think believe in a lot of the same things, but there, there are people within people's families, friends, whatever group who don't get to know Anthony DeRuzzi, Scotty Lewis. They don't get to know their stories and who they are at the core. Um, and they may not ever have a conversation with, with people of color. So then 
the, the those people have to bridge those gaps and and have opened up the conversations so that we can come together. So, you know, I think it, it's crazy. It took a worldwide pandemic to get everybody to sit down and listen and be able to talk these things through. Um, you know, I'm at home with my my family right now in Virginia, and you know that's all me and my father have been talking about. Um, so, you know, the conversations just have to keep keep continuing and. Um, I think the thing with it is is people have to be prepared to uh, have tough conversations with people they love. Thanks, Coach Nichols. Well, guys, that brings us to about an hour here, so um, I don't want to cut anybody off, but um, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to have this this discussion with us. For those of you who have, who have set in and, and listened on this discussion, thank you for taking the time um, to educate yourselves. Uh, within the UAA, we're gonna have a bunch more uh, opportunities to continue these conversations and this education. So um, thank you everybody uh, and, and have a great day. Thanks guys. <laughs>